So in review, the ascending pathways are transmitting information from the skin and muscle um, spindle receptors about body position and sending that information up to the thalamus and then on to the somatosensory cortex. The spinocerebellar tracts don't go to the thalamus, they stop at the level of the cerebellum. So that's um, where we see the unconscious awareness of our body position is through that tract. So the uh, conscious body position is through the spinothalamic pathways and the dorsal pathways, and then the spinocerebellar is the unconscious body position. And I have a nice summary table posted on Blackboard of the tracks. So I'll go to that spot in Blackboard. So this is in your lecture folder for neuronal physiology. And you'll see the three different um, ascending tracks are shown there. The information that's carried by each tract is listed, where the action potential or where that first order neuron is located. So these are all the ascending tracks. It's carrying sensory information from receptors out in some sensory receptor is out in some organ. So in the case of the dorsal column, it's in the skin or proprioceptors of the muscles. In the spinal thalamic, it's looking at pain, temperature, crude touch, and pressure information. So those are going to be in mechanoreceptors for pressure. Thermoreceptors detect temperature differences. And nociceptors are for pain. So that's where the different receptors would be uh, that's what they're called, the names for the different receptors carrying this information or you know, creating an action potential when these stimuli st activate these receptors. And then the spinocerebellar, like I said, is for that subconscious body position and proprioception. So we have these special receptors in our joint and muscle that tell us what our body position is. And unconsciously, we have this um, information coming in up this tract that goes to the cerebellum. So again, there's only two neurons in series for the spinocerebellar because it stops at the cerebellum and relays that information there. And these neurons do not cross over the spinal cord. The other tracks we see crossing over for the dorsal column, we see it crosses over at the medulla, the second order neuron does. And in the spinal thalamic, it crosses over at the spinal cord. So if we look back at these tracks, here we, here's the dorsal. We can see it crosses over here at the medulla. So this is our first order neuron going up the spinal cord on the same side. And then when it reaches the medulla, it crosses over and goes to the other side of the brain. So information on the right side of the body is perceived at the left side of the brain. And then if we look at the spinocerebellar, like I said, that goes up the spine comes into the spinal cord, comes up the same side, does not cross over, and just stops at the cerebellum. So here's the cerebellum, and there's that second order neuron. There is no third order neuron in the spinal cerebellar pathway. And then the last one was the spinal thalamic that we talked about. And here we can see that information comes in. This is for pain and temperature comes in, first order neuron, and when it synapses with the second order neuron, that immediately crosses over at the spinal cord level and goes up and tra transmits information to the third order neuron that's up here in the primary somatosensory cortex. So it comes up and then is uh, synapses with the third order neuron here and is perceived in the primary somatosensory cortex. So again, looking at the chart I put on Blackboard, the spinal thalamic tract crosses over immediately at the spinal cord. And where they end, all the ascending tracts, other than the spinal cerebellar, all end in that somatosensory cortex. That's where that sensation is perceived by the brain. And then with the spinal cerebellar, because it's subconscious body position, it ends in the cerebellum. The cerebellum is not the thinking part of our brain. It deals with subconscious um, activity and movements. So the descending tracks now, if we go back to our PowerPoint, these carry information from the brain to the spinal cord and out to the skeletal muscles. There's direct and indirect pathways. We're going to just talk about the direct pathway that's a little more straightforward. So these are motor tracks going, starting from the primary motor uh, cortex and working its way down the spinal cord out to the skeletal muscles. So there's an upper motor neuron that starts in the cortex up in the cerebrum 
and then there's a lower motor neuron that goes from the ventral horn of the spinal cord out to the muscle. So when you look at the direct pathway, the direct motor pathway, we call that the pyramidal system, and that is for fast, fine, skilled movements. So this is control of the fingertips with writing, playing an instrument, um, activities like that. So if we follow that down, so here's the um, per pyramidal direct. There's two types. There's lateral and ventral. They start in the primary motor cortex, come down out of the brain, down the spinal cord, and we can see that one crosses over the lateral um, pyramidal system crosses over and where it crosses over is at the medulla it crosses over comes down the spinal cord and then the lower motor neuron starts here at the spinal cord and goes out to the skeletal muscle there is a small interneuron here in this descending pathway but we're going to not talk about that one we're just going to refer to upper and lower mo uh, motor neurons so here's the upper motor neuron coming down the spinal cord synapsing at the level of the spinal cord and then going out to skeletal muscle. If you look at the other one, the ventral tract, it comes down and then at the level of the spinal cord crosses over and then the lower motor neuron starts again in that ventral horn and out to the skeletal muscle. The other pathways that bring information from the brain out to the periphery are the indirect or extrapyramidal, and there's a lot of different uh, structures involved in those descending pathways. We're not going to go into the details of those, um, but just focus on the pyramidal pathway, the one descending track that we're going to focus on for our class. But it's important that we have these other um, extra pyramidal descending tracks because balance, posture, coarse muscle movements, head, neck, and eye movements are all part of this extra pyramidal system. But again, I'm not going to go into the details. I'm not going to expect you to know the details of those pathways. So this, these, these, um, this particular tract is the rubral spinal tract. Again, I'm not going to hold you accountable for this. Just um, just, it's just mentioned here as an extra tract that we could examine, but all part of that extra pyramidal tract. So why is this important? Why do we need to know about um, descending tracts? Well, when we look at different diseases, sometimes it's a, a problem with the upper motor neuron of a descending tract or a lower motor neuron of a descending tract. So when we look at the types of, for example, um, losses in movement, we see um, different types of paralysis depending on the motor neuron that's affected in the disease or the injury. So whenever we have something like a paresthesia, which is uh, another name for numbness or tingling, that's a loss, a sensory loss. So that might mean there's some damage to a spinal nerve that carries that sensory neuron and something with the um, ascending tracts. But paralysis is a loss of motor function, so that indicates something wrong with that motor neuron, uh, the ventral horn of the spinal cord, or something with a descending tract, or the primary motor cortex. So a lot of different possibilities can lead to either loss of sensation or loss of motor function. But it's important to distinguish between an ascending tract and a descending tract, or the ventral root or dorsal root because they carry opposite information. Remember the dorsal horn of the spinal cord and the dorsal root carry that sensory information and the ventral root and the ventral horn carry motor information. So it's important that we distinguish those two in terms of what type of losses we would see, whether it's paralysis or um, paresthesias or numbness tingling. So if we look at flaccid paralysis, that means there's damage to that lower motor neuron, that the, the muscles are unable to receive any kind of stimulation because the, the neuron that synapses on that muscle is damaged. So fl flaccid paralysis is damage to the lower motor neuron. Spastic paralysis, on the other hand, the, the lower motor neuron is intact, so we see some reflex activity at the level of the spinal cord, but there's some damage to that upper motor neuron that's causing an abnormal contraction of that muscle, and there's no voluntary control of that muscle because there's damage to the upper motor neuron that starts in the primary cortex. So we see this in situations of stroke, when there's been a, a blockage or a hemorrhage in the brain that can damage the motor uh, cortex 
and the neurons that begin there, and that's going to result in a spastic paralysis because the lower motor neuron is still intact. And if we go back to our Blackboard page, I put this little chart here to kind of distinguish again the different tracks and also this spastic versus flaccid paralysis. So diseases of the upper motor neuron are all going to be up at the level of the brain so when you're looking at stroke, multiple sclerosis, that's also in the central nervous system, um, cerebral palsy and traumatic brain injuries, those are going to damage those upper motor neurons that start in the motor cortex and we're going to see spastic paralysis. So the, the limbs are going to look stiff and resistant to passive movement. Lower motor neuron damage, again, is going to cause flaccid paralysis because there's no reflex activity with that lower motor neuron. And where we diseases where we see flaccid paralysis would be spinal cord injury, ALS, which is also called Lou Gehrig's disease, polio, and Guillain-Barre. So you're going to see total paralysis. The muscles will atrophy. They're going to have low tone. And sometimes they'll have fasciculations, which are little twitches over the muscle as the muscle is looking for stimulation from the neuron, but it's not receiving any neurons, so it has a little hyper excitability because of that. We call those fasciculations or little um, almost small tremors under the skin over those flaccid paralyzed muscles. So we can assess spinal cord trauma by looking at the type of um, paralysis that is present or loss of sensation that is present. For example, we had a patient that um, had no ability to move, so he had damage to the descending tract and the uh, lower motor neuron up, um, as well as possibly the upper motor neuron. It's hard to, hard to say, but most likely the lower motor neuron because he had a spinal cord injury and um, he could feel everything so his ascending tracks were intact but the, the spinal cord injury affected the ventral root or ventral horn of the spinal cord and he couldn't move. He eventually recovered so that's the good news about that particular patient but it was uh, definitely a difficult time as he was unable to move. He was paralyzed from the neck down. So when we look at different types of um, paralysis, when an injury occurs anywhere from the thoracic region, T1, that nerve between T1 and L1 of the spinal cord, we see paralysis from the waist down. And any time there is damage in any of the cervical spinal nerves or region of the spinal cord, we're going to see quadriplegia. So, um, cervical damage in the spinal cord leads to paralysis from the neck down. So we talked about the cranial nerves in lab. I'm not going to go through those again. All that I would ask that you remember is that this is part of the peripheral nervous system. So when we look at these nerves here, they're made up of myelinated axons outside the central nervous system. So they extend away from the brain. Just because they're on the brain doesn't mean that they are part of the brain. So this is the olfactory um, nerve, which becomes the olfactory tract as it enters and becomes part of the brain. Same thing here, we have the optic nerves that have been cut, but as they descend into the brain, they become the optic tract, which is part of the brain. Remember we said that myelinated axons in the brain and spinal cord we call a tract and myelinated axons outside the brain and spinal cord are called a nerve. So all of these nerves we see extending away from the brain, those are part of the peripheral nervous system. So there's 12 pairs of cranial nerves and 31 pairs of spinal nerves that are all part of the peripheral nervous system. So they're carrying um, sensory and motor information. And some of the cranial nerves, if you remember from lab, some are purely sensory, some are purely motor, and some are a mixture. So here this kind of lists the type of um, fibers that they carry, either sensory or motor, and then what that information is. So again, that's from lab. I'm not going to ask you to know that again for lecture. All I want you to know is that it's part of the peripheral nervous system, those cranial nerves. So then we move on to the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system is, remember, are those, is the nervous system that controls the um, smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and glands. So it's that involuntary part of our body that keeps us operating on a minute to minute basis. It controls our blood pressure, it controls smooth muscle contraction in our digestive tract, in our urinary tract, and keeps maintains homeostasis along with the help of the endocrine system. 
So again, this is the subconscious system in the terms of we're not aware and we have no direct control over the activities of the autonomic nervous system. So this is part of the motor response from the body. So remember, if the motor response is activating a, a voluntary skeletal muscle, we call that part of the somatic nervous system. But the autonomic nervous system controls cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, and glands. And it, the response to those organs can either be a fight or flight stress response on those organs, or it can be a rest and digest response. So the parasympathetic is uh, division of this response are those neurons that calm the body during restful situations. So when we're digesting well, breathing slowly, heart rate is slower, those are the parasympathetic neurons that are dominating during that time and sending their impulses and releasing their neurotransmitters to those organs to stimulate them. The sympathetic division would be activated and would override the parasympathetic during times of stress, What's, during intense exercise, um, stressful situations, getting in an argument, chronic life stressors. That's when we see the sympathetic system dominating and those neurons relating their neurotransmitters on their respective organs. So they all differ in how they, um, the effector cells that they act upon. Um, the pathways and the neurotransmitters they release, and how the target organs respond to those neurotransmitters. So again, looking at the effector cells of the somatic system, that's skeletal muscles, autonomic, it's cardiac smooth muscle, or glands. And if we look at the somatic nervous system in terms of the neurotransmitter released, all motor neurons release acetylcholine to those muscle cells to respond. And in the autonomic nervous system, some of them release ACH and others release norepinephrine. So we'll talk about that when we compare these um, in a little bit here. So if we compare the sympathetic and the parasympathetic divisions of the autonomic nervous system, we can see that where the neur neurons originate are different. So in the parasympathetic nervous system, we see that the neurons start in the brain stem and also in the sacral region of the spinal cord. We don't see any parasympathetic neurons originating here in the thoracic, cervical, or lumbar region. So we call the parasympathetic nervous system the cranial sacral division because the neurons originate in the brain, that's where the cranial part comes from, or the sacral region of the spinal cord. So we call it the cranial sacral division because that's where those neurons originate. The sympathetic nervous system, on the other hand, originates from the thoracic and lumbar regions. If we look at where these green neurons originate for the sympathetic nervous system, thoracic lumbar, so we call this the thoracolumbar division because that's where those neurons originate. And if we look at the parasympathetic and sympathetic chain in terms of how that impulse is conducted, we can see there's two neurons involved. So on the parasympathetic side, the blue or purplish neurons, there's two there. And then in the sympathetic, there's also two. So we call the first neuron, where the impulse begins, we call this the preganglionic neuron. And this is the postganglionic neuron. So we already talked about that in the first lecture, first part of our lecture. So preganglionic, postganglionic. So the ganglion is where we see cell bodies and dendrites outside the central nervous system. So there's the ganglia for each of these neurons where they meet. So in this chain, we can see there's the preganglionic neuron here, and in light green, the postganglionic neuron, and here's the ganglia. And they form a chain nice and close to the spinal cord on the sympathetic nervous system. So this is a sympathetic chain ganglia. It just looks like a swelling right alongside the spinal cord where we find the cell bodies of that postganglionic neuron. So that's only in the sympathetic nervous system where we see this chain, this chain ganglia. In the parasympathetic nervous system, the ganglia are very close to the target organs. And notice the length of that postganglionic neuron. Very short in the parasympathetic, but in the sympathetic, that postganglionic neuron is much longer. And the preganglionic neuron is much shorter, where in the parasympathetic, 
the preganglionic neuron is much longer. And if we look at this particular neuron here, notice all the branches that it has to the heart, the lungs, the stomach, pancreas, liver, gallbladder. There's a lot of innervation coming off of this one cranial nerve. And this is cranial nerve number 10, the vagus nerve. So the vagus nerve has branches out to all the organs which control the parasympathetic response to those organs. So again, this is the rest and digest division. So it's slowing the heart, slowing the breathing rate, promoting digestion, promoting, again, pancreatic release of enzymes, liver and gallbladder, all promoting digestion. So if we look at the um, parasympathetic nervous system, we can see the different organs that it, that it um, terminates on. But again, if we look at the vagus nerve, the cranial nerve um, number 10, it in, innervates these heart, lungs, and most of our visceral organs. So a lot of parasympathetic outflow goes from that vagus nerve. And then we see some of the other cranial nerves here. Some go to the eye, others go to the glands in the mouth, nose, and um, the glossopharyngeal promotes salivation. And then in the sacral region, we see that it targets the, the intestines to promote bowel movements and smooth muscle secretion, the contraction of the bladder, the ureters, and reproductive organs. So when we think of the parasympathetic nervous system being the rest and digest, its influence on all of these organs is to secrete or promote their watery secretion. So the parasympathetic nervous response, when it's dominating on these organs, is promoting tearing, salivation, secretion of digestive juices, and urination. So that's the parasympathetic response. It's a wet response. So think of wet. Some people say SLUD, S-L-U-D-D, -D, which is salivation, lacrimation, which is tearing, urination, defecation, and digestion. That's the parasympathetic response when these neurons are activating and releasing their neurotransmitters on these organs. The sympathetic nervous system, again, is in the, the thoracic and lumbar regions of the spinal cord, and they pass through that chain of ganglia here, right alongside the spinal cord, and then out to the different organs. So again, these are spinal nerves then. Now we saw that the parasympathetic nervous system involves some of the cranial nerves here, we see the cranial nerves are controlling some of those structures, but in the um, sympathetic nervous system, these are all spinal nerves carrying that information out to those organs. And again, this is the fight or flight stress response. So it's going to speed up the heart rate, increase breathing, dilate the airways, slow digestion. So it's going to inhibit digestion in the stomach. It's going to inhibit mass movements in the large intestine. And it's going to inhibit contraction of the bladder. So again, we have the different spinal nerves that are that meet um, in the ganglia outside the spinal cord, and there's what that chain looks like along the spinal cord. Looking at some other information here that is um, interesting in terms of how those nerves come into the spinal cord and then travel up the spinal cord for processing is we find that the same neurons that are carrying sensory information from the heart travel the same pathway as the skin sensations, the ascending pathways that are carrying um, somatic sensory information from the skin and the muscles. So when a person complains of chest pain, because of the heart being deprived of oxygen, we notice that they'll complain that their whole left side of their chest hurts, and they also have sensations coming down the left side of the arm, or the left arm. They might feel numbness and tingling because the pathways of the neurons from the heart are traveling in the same pathway, the same ascending pathway as those um, receptors in the skin and muscle. So we feel, they feel numbness and tingling. And if we look elsewhere here, we can see the same pathways are shared over the skin of the jaw and the neck, and even up to the lower ear. We've had patients complain that their, their teeth hurt when actually it's a heart attack. Another example we can see here too is when someone is having gallbladder pain, so here's the, where the gallbladder is located, but the spinal 
uh, pathway, spinal nerve pathway, into the, the um, spinal cord for processing also travels from the skin over the right shoulder. So right shoulder pain can be an indicator of liver or gallbladder disease. So those are the two main um, things that we call referred pain when somebody has pain of some um, origin within an organ it can actually be referred out over the skin and the muscles where those pathways share a common path. So neurotransmitters again um, different fibers release um, within the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system release different neurotransmitters. So parasympathetic neurons release acetylcholine and sympathetic neurons release norepinephrine and there's some exceptions to that um, the sweat glands and blood vessels and skeletal muscles release acetylcholine but we'll talk about these you know using this nice diagram here so if we look at the parasympathetic and sympathetic neurons kind of side by side here we see this is um, in the central nervous system what's shaded in beige here is the central nervous system so we have these original neurons here starting in the central nervous system again these are starting in the thoracolumbar regions of the spinal cord and this is in the cranial sacral region of the spinal cord but as that impulse is generated it goes out and meets up with the second neuron the postganglionic neuron and here's the ganglia what's shown in yellow here that's the ganglia where the two neurons meet so this is a cell body outside the central nervous system here that's what makes it a ganglia we'll see a little swelling there and so this first neuron secretes acetylcholine. So if we look at both types of neurons in the sympathetic nervous system, either one that meets up directly with another neuron or the one that meets up with the adrenal medulla, remember um, in the endocrine system we've said that there is neural stimulation where we have a neuron stimulating an endocrine gland. So there's receptors on the adrenal medulla for acetylcholine that tells it to release epinephrine into the bloodstream. So this is an endocrine gland here. It's one exception that we see um, in terms of how this preganglionic neuron stimulates an organ. Some can be through the blood by releasing epinephrine. So again, we have acetylcholine is released by all preganglionic neurons, whether they are parasympathetic or sympathetic. They all three examples here release acetylcholine. But the postganglionic neuron is a little different in that some sympathetic neurons are going to release nor, nor oh, I'm sorry all sympathetic neurons release norepinephrine and that another name for that is adrenaline so we know that adrenaline speeds things up and causes that fight or flight response in those organs that have receptors for norepinephrine the parasympathetic postganglionic neuron releases acetylcholine. So we call these neurons, these parasympathetic neurons that release acetylcholine, we call them cholinergic. And if they release norepinephrine, which is also called adrenaline, we call them adrenergic. So this is an adrenergic neuron because it releases adrenaline or norepinephrine, same thing. And this is a cholinergic neuron because it releases acetylcholine. And if we look at the myelination, you'll see that the myelination here is only in the preganglionic neuron. The postganglionic neuron is not myelinated. Again, that's going to slow the release a little bit, control that response a little bit in the postganglionic neuron. So again, this is the autonomic nervous system, so we're looking at smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and glands that these neurotransmitters are going to act upon. So looking at receptors then, we have receptors in these organs out here that are going to bind either acetylcholine or norepinephrine. So it depends on the organ and the receptors present if it's going to bind either acetylcholine or norepinephrine. Remember that all skeletal muscle cells have receptors for acetylcholine because at the neuromuscular junction, the stimulation of that skeletal muscle cell relies on acetylcholine and that's going to cause contraction in every case. So the types of receptors that we see that bind acetylcholine are called nicotinic and muscarinic receptors and these are just based on drugs that also bind to these receptors and act like acetylcholine. So nicotine and muscarine 
bind to receptors just like acetylcholine does. So that's why we named these receptors nicotinic or muscarinic. So where we find nicotinic receptors is on all skeletal muscle cells. So again, these respond to acetylcholine. So all skeletal muscle cells are stimulated to contract with the help of acetylcholine. And then all of those neurons in the ganglia are nicotinic. So if we go back up here and look at our diagram, the receptors on the adrenal medulla, on this cell body, and this cell body are all nicotinic because they respond, they bind acetylcholine. So these are called nicotinic receptors because they bind acetylcholine. So muscarinic receptors are found by our, what we find them um, on, they also bind acetylcholine just like the cholinergic um, nicotinic receptors, but they depend, but their response to that can be either inhibitory or excitatory. So if we look at muscarinic receptors, these are on all the parasympathetic target organs. So if we go back up to our diagram here, muscarinic receptors are found here and they bind acetylcholine. So if they bind acetylcholine, they're muscarinic receptors in these target organs here of the, paras of the parasympathetic nervous system. So adrenergic receptors are those that bind norepinephrine or adrenaline. So these are found on the sympathetic um, organs or organs on, uh, that respond to the sympathetic stimulation. So if we go back to our diagram here. So if we're looking to speed up the heart rate, then norepinephrine is going to be released from the postganglionic neuron and that's going to bind to the adrenergic receptors on the heart muscle cells. And there's different types of adrenergic receptors. So if we look at adrenergic receptors, we have alpha receptors and beta receptors. And some organs have more of one type than the other. So if we look at our chart here, we can see that the heart has mostly beta-1 receptors and the lungs have mostly beta-2 receptors. And then we also find beta-2 receptors on the blood vessels serving the heart, liver, and skeletal muscle. And we also find beta-3 receptors on adipose tissue. Alpha-1 and alpha-2 receptors are scattered throughout the body. The alpha-1 particularly, we find that all over the body for the, again, the sympathetic binding um, of norepinephrine is what all of these are for. So it's going to cause this, when these receptors are bound with norepinephrine, we're going to see all the fight or flight response effects in these organs. So a good way to remember the heart and lungs, beta-1 receptors, we only have one heart, so there's beta-1 receptors, and we have two lungs, so there's beta-2 receptors. It's a good way to remember beta-1 from beta-2. And maybe you've heard that some people with high blood pressure take a medicine called metoprolol or propanolol or car um, Carbidolol. Those are all called beta blockers, and beta blockers means they're blocking the receptors on the heart to norepinephrine because norepinephrine is a fight or flight stress neurotransmitter, and if a person has high blood pressure, we don't want to see an increased heart rate. We don't want to see in, um, constricted blood vessels in the, in the heart. So as a result of that, we want to block that beta response. So some of our drugs that we use um, act like these um, neurotransmitters that bind to these specific receptors, or they block a receptor to prevent the body's natural neurotransmitters from binding. So atropine is an anticholinergic, so that means it's going to bind to muscarinic receptors on the salivary glands, and as a result of that, people will be given atropine to dry up the mouth during surgery so they're not drooling or they're not having saliva drip down the back of their throat causing an aspiration pneumonia. Um, in the eye drops that you might get at the um, ophthalmologist is that helps to dilate 
the eyes and allow them to examine the retina more clearly so they can look through those large pupils to look at the retina. So that's one effect of atropine. And neostigmine is a drug that inhibits the enzyme acetylcholine esterase. And like I said in the first lecture, that is used to keep that acetylcholine bound to receptors on the postganglionic mem or the postsynaptic membrane of the muscle cell and keeping that acetylcholine bound so sodium can travel sodium can travel in through the membrane and keep that action potential going in the muscle cells because myasthenia gravis is damaged to those receptors on the motor end plate and results in muscle weakness. So when we look at cold medicine it's binding um, or I'm sorry, it's stimulating those alpha adrenergic receptors, so it's going to decrease secretions. So me medicines like chlorpheniramine uh, malleate, um, loratadine, those um, allergy medicines act to uh, prevent mucus secretion and the watery secretions that we see with colds and allergies. And like I said, beta, blocker, beta blockers can be used to um, dilate the blood vessels and also to dilate the airways in people that have asthma. So they block those receptors for norepinephrine. So here's just a, a series of different medicines that we see and what their action would be, and it's all binding receptors, either nicotinic or muscarinic receptors, or in the case of the um, sympathetic response, adrenergic receptors. We have some that um, enhance the sympathetic response. We call those sympathomimetic agents. And if they are blocking that sympathetic response, then we call them sympatholytic agents. So beta blockers would be sympatholytic agents. So when we look at any typical organ, like the heart or the pupil of the eye, they have what we call dual innervation. And dual innervation means that they have neurons that are sympathetic, releasing norepinephrine, and they also have neurons that are parasympathetic, releasing acetylcholine. So that's how we can control those organs. For example, the heart. The heart has beta receptors that respond to norepinephrine to speed up the heart rate and increase the force of contraction when we are under a stressful situation. But they also have muscarinic receptors that will slow the heart rate, slow the, uh, decrease the force of contraction in restful periods when the parasympathetic nervous system is dominating. In the pupil of the eye, we see uh, receptors for the sympathetic nervous system to dilate the, air, to dilate the eyes, um, dilate the pupil, and then we see the parasympathetic um, neurons releasing, again, acetylcholine binding to muscarinic receptors that would constrict the pupil. So some, some organs only have sympathetic um, stimulation. Uh, for example, the blood vessels um, have what we call sympathetic tone, which means they have constant stimulation of the sympathetic nervous system by those neurons releasing norepinephrine to keep some contraction present. And it's important because if we had no sympathetic tone, our blood pressure would drop and we would lose blood flow to our vital organs, we'd pass out and die. So to maintain blood pressure, we have to have some tone, some sympathetic stimulation to our blood vessels at all times. Parasympathetic tone, again, we have that active all the time to, to slow our heart rate. For example, um, the heart rate at the SA node is set to beat about 100 beats per minute, but because of parasympathetic tone, that brings that heart rate down to about 75 to 80. So that's important that we have some parasympathetic, I'm sorry, some parasympathetic stimulation to our organs to keep our sympathetic response in check. Some of these um, innervations are um, constantly active um, in terms of, I shouldn't say constantly, are, they, are, they take turns, I should say, dominating when we talk about certain reflex responses. 
For example, during the sex act for male and females, we see the parasympathetic fibers are dominating during the foreplay and arousal state, and the sympathetic fibers are dominating during orgasm. So both um, fibers are important to the sex response and for reproduction, but the parasympathetic dominates originally or in the arousal period and the sympathetic fibers are dominating during orgasm and causing ejaculation of semen. So when we look at um, when these are dominating, the parasympathetic effects on the body are rather short-lived, where the sympathetic response is a little more longer lasting. So when we talk about people that live stressful lives or have a stressful event, it's going to take a while for that norepinephrine to, be, to break down and be metabolized by the body. So we see the effects of sympathetic stimulation lasting a little bit longer. So and again, this just reiterates what I just said, is the norepinephrine is metabolized a little slower than acetylcholine. And we have that release into the blood rather than locally on an organ because of the effects of the madrina, adrenal, adrenal medulla, which is part of the endocrine system, where acetylcholine is released just directly onto the target organ. And the liver is what's going to break down that norepinephrine. So the boss of the autonomic nervous system, just like we saw in the endocrine system, is the hypothalamus. So it's the main integrator of the um, autonomic nervous system. So it's constantly sampling um, for the endocrine system, you know, levels of different hormones, but also looking at, you know, uh, blood sugar levels and um, temperature and um, other more autonomic effects throughout the body. But we do see some um, cerebral input and the limbic system is our emotional brain, we can see that influencing the autonomic nervous system. For example, a person can just be thinking about a stressful event and that can stimulate the sympathetic response. So it's not anything that's maintaining homeostasis, it's a thought that can result in these um, stressful responses by the body. So when we're living um, you know, a lifestyle that causes a lot of stress, maybe at work or at home, we're overriding that hypothalamic control and, you know, triggering that sympathetic response and all the effects on the body. And we know that over time, stress can cause increased blood pressure and increased heart rate, and that's hard on the heart over time. So the hypothalamus has, you know, overall integration control of the autonomic nervous system, but again, thoughts and feelings can influence that hypothalamic control and lead to domination of the sympathetic or the parasympathetic. So when we use, you know, uh, positive imagery, we can, re we can decrease um, the stress response and stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system just by having control over our thoughts. So that's where the importance of meditation and that thoughtful part of yoga comes into play because we can control um, and influence our blood pressure and heart rate and digestive processes through that meditation and that um, higher level thought at the cerebrum. So anytime we talk about the hypothalamus, we're talking about control of the heart rate and blood pressure, body temperature, water balance. Our thirst centers are part of, are partly con are controlled by the hypothalamus. We talked about endocrine activity; it controls that pituitary gland, and our emotional feelings also are influenced by the hypothalamic um, control, and then our fight or flight response again because of the sympathetic nervous system. So when we see problems with the autonomic nervous system as a child, it's because of injury. Normally it should be focused, it should be functioning properly. But as we age, we see some changes um, of those axon terminals of the preganglionic neuron, and we see some changes in autonomic control. So we tend to see higher blood pressure as we age. Most people, uh, not most, I should say many, need um, blood pressure medication as they age. They also have trouble with water balance. The kidneys don't quite function as well as they should. So we see some um, decline in the functioning of the autonomic nervous system.
Um, other examples, constipation as we age, smooth muscle contraction is not quite as efficient, so we really have to watch what um, we eat as we age, making sure we're getting enough water and enough fiber and enough activity to keep the bowels moving. We see drier eyes, um, more frequent eye infections because of the drier eyes, and the less ability to correct our blood pressure when we go from a, uh, a laying down or seated position to standing. So this is, in, I've seen this happen in church. When we stand up, I'll notice this, you know, I've seen, I've, I've come to the aid of elderly people that have fallen over when they st stood up because they, their body was less able to adjust the diameter of their blood vessels as they stood from a sitting to standing and they had too low of a blood pressure to perfuse blood into their brain and they lost consciousness for a short period of time. And all you need to do for those people is just have them lay there, put their um, knees up, get their, you know, sort, get their mentation and, you know, awareness back and have them sit up and, and rise slowly and they'll typically be okay. So I want to draw your attention to um, a, a worksheet that I put out on Blackboard to help you review some of these um, topics related to receptors. And I'm going to grab it right here. So you'll find this worksheet under learning materials for a lecture and I'd like you to practice with these and see if you can assign the correct receptors and I'll do the first one for you. This uh, for slowing the heart rate we would say that acetylcholine binds to muscarinic receptors on the heart. And all you have to do is look at the, the response we're looking for, decide if it's going to be parasympathetic or a sympathetic response on that organ. And if it's sympathetic, then, for example, raising the heart rate, then we know that is a sympathetic response on the heart. And that would be norepinephrine binding to beta receptors on the heart. So I put a little cheat sheet down here for you to help you remember what type of receptors might exist, whether it's sympathetic or post-sympathetic. And you can always go back to your PowerPoint as well. And I have a list of the effects, I'm sorry, not on the PowerPoint, but there's another um, resource I put out on Blackboard under Learning Materials, that five-page document. Um, I think it's five pages, let's see. It's this one here. It has a list of all the effects of the nervous system on of the autonomic nervous system on the different organs so it's kind of a nice little reference for you down here at the bottom um, right here tells you you know when it binds what it does to that particular organ um, so it's parasympathetic sympathetic effects so it's sympathetic if it's a sympathetic response in that organ it's going to bind to those alpha or beta receptors if it's a parasympathetic effect it's going to bind to muscarinic receptors so you have to determine that and i will post an answer key for this worksheet so you have something to reference to check your understanding of these concepts So any questions on the assignment, you can always shoot me an email, but otherwise you will see um, an answer key to check your understanding.